we're going to start with an overview of cell division because in order to have a proper understanding of how trisomy really manifests, you need to understand cell division and where the genetic abnormality is coming from. So if you recall, trisomy is a polysomy where non-disjunction creates a gamete with extra chromosomes. So normally, in normal meiosis, you have your cell and there are homologous chromosomes and these will come to a meiotic spindle during anaphase and they will separate from each other. And if that separation occurs normally, then the cell will bud off into two cells, each with their respective chromosomes. Then the process will happen again and you'll get four gametes that are haploid in nature. This is what normally happens. This is, of course, an overview of meiosis, and the split occurs first in the anaphase of meiosis 1, and then in the anaphase of meiosis 2. So that's what happens normally, but what happens in non-disjunction? Well, let's go through the process and talk about non-disjunction in meiosis 1 and non-disjunction in meiosis 2. So let's say that our chromosomes come together and align across the meiotic spindle. In anaphase, they should split apart so that they can move in the direction of the budding cell. So they move apart, but in non-disjunction, specifically in non-disjunction of meiosis 1, homologous chromosomes do not separate properly. And what you end up getting is too many chromosomes on one side of the budding cell. So when the cell splits into its two different cells, you have this. You have three chromosomes in one and one chromosome in the other. Then, of course, you have to align across the meiotic spindle in meiosis 2 and repeat the process in anaphase. When the split happens again, what you get is this. And what we call this is n plus 1, n plus 1, n minus 1, and n minus 1. That is to say that if non-disjunction occurs in meiosis 1, you get two cells that are trisomy. Two cells have n plus 1 when they should just have n. So this is what happens when non-disjunction occurs in meiosis 1. Again, if the homologous chromosomes do not separate properly across the meiotic spindle during anaphase of meiosis 1, you get two cells that are trisomy in nature, which is to say that you get two cells that are n plus 1, and then just high yield to know as well, you get two cells that are n minus 1. So non-disjunction in meiosis 1 is 2 trisomy. But what happens if you get non-disjunction in meiosis 2? Well, let's do that example now. So the first split occurs properly. The chromosomes, the homologous chromosomes align across the meiotic spindle and in the anaphase of meiosis one, they separate properly and you get this. Now we're in meiosis two and we're at the anaphase stage again. So the chromosomes come to the meiotic spindle and now they should separate into their sister chromatids. So they try to separate during anaphase, but what happens if the cell on the right cannot pull apart, a pull apart those sister chromatids properly. If instead one does not pull apart, this is the result. And how do we label this? You have n and n on the two cells on the left, n plus 1 and n minus 1 for the two cells on the right. So that is to say that if non-disjunction occurs in meiosis 2, you get one cell with trisomy. So how do we summarize this? Non-disjunction in meiosis 1 is 2 trisomy, and non-disjunction in meiosis 2 is 1 trisomy. So whatever the meiosis is, it's just the opposite for how many cells are actually trisomic. So that's the high yield way to remember that. Now that you have an understanding of how cell division works and how trisomy actually comes about through the genetic cell division during anaphase, let's get into the specifics of each of the trisomy disorders so that you can understand the high yield symptoms that you'll see on your USMLE or your COMLEX. The three trisomies that classically present are trisomy 21, trisomy 18, and trisomy 13. These, of course, are Down syndrome, Edwards syndrome, and Patel syndrome. How do you remember which trisomy corresponds to which syndrome? Well, if you can't memorize them already, I have a little mnemonic here to help you. 21 is when you can down alcohol, 18 for Edward, and 13 is the age of puberty, or Patel. So 13 is going to go with everything that has to do with P, 18 for Edward, the E in Edward and the E in 18, and 21 is when you can down alcohol. Down, of course, for Down syndrome. Let's start by talking about the high yield symptoms and associations of trisomy 21. Now, this is, of course, the highest yield trisomy in this slide, and most of your attention, if you can only dedicate it to one of these diseases, should go to trisomy 21. Trisomy 21 
is has a lot of associated symptoms and a lot of associated buzzwords and images that they can show you on your exam to push you in this direction. So because of that, we need a really complex but useful and effective mnemonic to remember this. So I'm going to change the mnemonic slightly. 21 is when you can down alcohol and beer. So we're going to use the letters in alk and beer to remind us what all the high yield symptoms are. So 21 and Down syndrome are only in the mnemonic to help you remember that trisomy 21 is Down syndrome. The ALK and the beer letters are what we're going to use for the slew of high-yield symptoms and associations. So here they are. We've got four A's, LCH, and then the word beer. So the four A's stand for an atrioventricular septal defect, atresia of the duodenum, aka duodenal atresia, AML and ALL, advanced maternal age, lucency, crease for single palmar crease, Hirschsprung disease, and then beer stands for Brushfield spots, early Alzheimer's disease, epicanthal folds, that is to say prominent epicanthal folds, and Robertsonian translocation. And the reason that I throw in Robertsonian translocation is because in 4% of patients with trisomy 21, the genetic cause is actually not non-disjunction, but it's due to a Robertsonian translocation. And it's really easy to remember that this occurs in 4% because down has four letters in it and beer has four letters in it. So in 4% of patients, Robertsonian translocations are the responsible genetic cause and not non-disjunction. But let's go through the high yield ones here. And I want to show you pictures to help you identify the associations that you'll have to look out for on your exam. So atrioventricular septal defects, or ASDs, are common in patients with trisomy 21. That's just very, very high yield to know. Atresia of the duodenum, aka duodenal atresia, again, very high yield to know. I'll show you a picture on the next slide. AML and ALL, well, of course, the patients with trisomy 21 are more likely to get these types of diseases. Advanced maternal age is a risk factor for trisomy 21. So the older that the mom is when she conceives, the more likely the child is to be diagnosed with trisomy 21. Nuchal translucency, which is lucency in our mnemonic here, is something that you'll see when the baby is still in the uterus when you're screening for trisomy 21. Single palmar crease, I'll show you on the next slide. Hirschsprung disease is a very high yield association with Down syndrome, so know that one. Rushfield spots are little spots on the eyes. I'll show you a picture. Early Alzheimer's disease, you really need to know that trisomy 21 confers a much greater risk of Alzheimer's disease later in life, earlier than the average patient would develop it. The reason for that is that when you have three of the 21st chromosome, you actually have more protein that contributes to the development of Alzheimer's. So that's where that comes from. Prominent epicanthal folds. I'll show you a picture of that. And we've already talked about Robertsonian translocation. So I want to show you some pictures of things that if you see them on your exam, you need to instantly think trisomy 21 because there's going to be some connection between the picture or the buzzword in the vignette and what they want you to answer. So here are some things that are associated with Down syndrome. Brushfield spots are those little brightened spots on the eye that you see in that top left picture. If you see a picture like that, answer is Down syndrome, trisomy 21. Duodenal atresia, don't forget your double bubble sign if you see an x-ray like that. The question could be asking you about GI physiology, but it also could be asking you something about genetics, such as trisomy 21. The epicanthal fold is the part of the skin that sort of is adjacent to the top of the eyelid that comes down and covers the duct at the medial portion of the eye. When that's really prominent, we call it prominent epicanthal folds. And if you see that, you should have an increased suspicion for trisomy 21. So keep these pictures in mind. I've got a few more. Let's keep going. A single palmar crease, aka a simian crease, is when you have one horizontal crease on the palm. Now, most people have more than one, and just because you have one doesn't necessarily mean that you have Down syndrome. It's just commonly found in patients who do have Down syndrome. So that simian crease or that single horizontal palmar crease is a very high yield association. Nuchal translucency, which in the mnemonic was just the L for lucency, is that space that you see uh, just behind the head when you're screening for this in utero. So if you see that nuchal translucency, it's very classically associated with Down syndrome. Those are the high yield pictures though, and this is the mnemonic. So once again, 21 is when you can down alcohol and beer. 21 and down reminds you that trisomy 21 is Down syndrome, and alk with four A's. A-A-A-L-C-H, 
for ASD, atresia, AML, advanced maternal age, lucency, crease, and Hirschsprung, and beer for the brush field spots that you see in the eyes, early onset Alzheimer's disease, prominent epicanthal folds, and in 4% of cases, Robertsonian translocations. Those are super high yield. That's why I included so many different associations on the slide. But if you can get that straight, you should get most, if not all, of your questions correct about trisomy 21. Let's switch gears and talk about trisomy 18, aka Edward syndrome. When we talk about trisomy 18, we need a mnemonic that reminds us not only that 18 is Edward syndrome, but that there are some additional very, very high yield symptoms, just like in Down syndrome. So the way that I remember this is, of course, 18 for Edward. The E's line up, and I know exactly which one it is. But taking it one step further, I remember the mnemonic, Edward Scissorhands. The reason that I remember this mnemonic is because when I think of Edward Scissorhands, who is a classic figure in a movie portrayed by Johnny Depp, I remember the prominent features associated with trisomy 18. The two highest yield features are shown here in this picture. One is Edward Scissorhands actually having a problem with his hands, and the other is Edward Scissorhands having such bushy and unkept hair that he has very low set ears. So the two high yield associations are of course low set ears, seen on the right, but clenched fists, seen on the left. So when I think of Edward Scissorhands, because he has scissors where his hands should be, it reminds me that the high yield symptom has something to do with the hands and that it is clenched fists. Low set ears because he's got a ton of hair and his ears are just kind of butting out on the bottom of his hair, again seen here in this picture. Low set ears, uh, seen here on the right. Those are the two high yield symptoms. There is one more that you need to know. And to remember it, I capitalize the R's in Edward and Scissorhands to remind me of rocker bottom feet. So rocker bottom feet look like this. They're sort of an up slanting foot that's uh, not properly shaped. And rocker bottom feet, the two R's in rocker, the R in Edward and the R in Scissorhands reminds me rocker bottom feet. So trisomy 18 really has three things that you need to know. Clenched fists, low set ears, and rocker bottom feet. Remember all of those with Edward Scissorhands by capitalizing the R's and 18 for Edward to remember the association. That's it. That's all you need to know. Trisomy 13 is Patel syndrome. And the way that we remember is that 13 is the age of puberty or that 13 is the age of Patel. So this has to do with the letter P. And all of the high yield symptoms also start with the letter P. So you've got your palate, prosencephaly, polycystic kidney disease, and polydactyly. When we say palate, we're referring to cleft lip or uh, cleft palate. Prosencephaly, we're referring to hollow prosencephaly, and I'll show you pictures of all these things on the next slide. Polycystic kidney disease is just that, and polydactyly means having more than five fingers. So the high yield associations that you should be looking out for on your exam is a cleft lip or a cleft palate, Hollow prosencephaly, where you fail to have encephalization of the brain, which is to say that the different lobes are not developing properly, which then in turn causes severe facial deformities that really are not too consistent with life. Polycystic kidney disease, look for the imaging where they show you cysts on the kidneys. It classically will be shown in a CT scan, but they might show you an ultrasound. They might show you some other modality, so just be on the lookout for that. Don't forget the association between polycystic kidney disease and berry aneurysms in the brain. And then polydactyly, of course, having more than five fingers. These are all symptoms of trisomy 13, and 13 is the age of puberty, 13 is the age of Patel, 13 is the P, so palate, polycystic, polydactyly, and prose and cephaly. Guys, if you can remember everything that I just talked about, you are golden with trisomy 21, trisomy 18, and trisomy 13.